This time on Crime Inc. Margaret Thatcher's narrow escape. Actor Kristen Slater in court again. The tragedy of Tiananmen Square. And El Capone's gangland wars. But first, the great train robbery. Britain's Royal Mail Train, the Glasgow to London Travelling Post Office. On August the 9th, 1963, it was the scene of a crime that captivated a nation, the Great Train Robbery. The operation to steal millions of pounds in used unmarked bills was planned with precision and carried out with unparalleled daring. The thieves targeted the second carriage from the front, where valuables, mostly cash, were stored. Usually the train only carried about 300,000 pounds, but because it had been a bank holiday weekend in Scotland, the coffers had swelled to about 2.3 million pounds, or 30 million pounds in today's money. The overnight train left Glasgow on Wednesday night. At three the next morning, driver Jack Mills had just passed Leighton Buzzard when he saw a red light signaling him to stop at Sears Crossing. The train came to a halt. What Mills didn't realize was the signal had been rigged by stuffing a glove over the green light and attaching a six-volt battery to the red. Co-driver David Whitby got out of the train to see what the problem was. He discovered the railway communications cable had been cut. Before he could get back into the train, he was attacked, handcuffed, and thrown down the embankment. In view of the robbery, British Railway's rule book was later amended to prohibit drivers from leaving the cab when they encountered a red light. Meanwhile, one of the robbers entered the cabin and knocked Jack Mills unconscious, leaving him bleeding from a big gash on his head. Although no one was seriously hurt, the experience shook the victims badly, especially Jack Mills, who never worked again. Like a very long year to you, Mr. Mills. Yes, sir. How do you feel now, yourself? Oh, How are you feeling? I feel all right in myself. Yes. But, uh, can't get rid of complications in my right arm. Yes. You're going back, you're, you are back at driving, aren't you, here? Well, it's uh, preparing, oiling. And, yes. Uh, and how's it going? Oh, not too bad. Uh, you think you'll be back driving again soon? No, I don't think so. The gang uncoupled the train, the taking who... just the engine and the carriage containing the loot. All those were too long. But they hit their first snag. Time, isn't it? Although they'd recruited a train driver known only as Peter, he found the train was more complicated than he'd expected. The gang was forced to bring Mills back to consciousness and get the groggy driver to move the train forward half a mile to Bridego Bridge. The robbery was carried out with such efficiency that none of the 75 male sorters left behind in the uncoupled carriages realized what had happened. The four sorters in the valuables compartment were tied up while 120 mail and money bags weighing two and a half tons were loaded into a lorry underneath the bridge. Then the gang seemed to disappear into thin air. A record 260,000 pound reward was posted. But police had one lead. Before they left, the robbers told their hostages they could call for help after half an hour had elapsed. So police concentrated their search on places within 30 minutes driving time of the crime scene. This search led them to Leather Slade Farm, an isolated property 27 miles away. Eight days after the robbery, police were delighted to discover that the deserted, dilapidated farmhouse had obviously been the gang's headquarters, with a wealth of fingerprint evidence found on a Monopoly board and ketchup bottle, and in the cellar, banknote wrappers, post office sacks, and mail packages. The gang had hired a local criminal to clean the scene, but in true underworld style, he'd pocketed his fee and failed to do the work. The next day, police made their first arrest. Roger Cordry had been hiding in a flat above a florist shop, but was undone when he paid for three months' rent of a garage in used 10 shilling notes. Owner Ethel Clark, the widow of a police officer, sensed something fishy and reported him to the police. The fingerprints led police to other members of the gang. Soon, Charlie Wilson, Robert Pelham, and Ronnie Biggs were in custody. But apart from a couple of suitcases stuffed with 100,000 pounds found hidden in a forest, there was no sign of the loot. Police began to piece together the crime. The group gathered at the farmhouse to prepare for the heist. 
then dressed in fatigues and drove trucks disguised as army issue to the bridge. The men changed into blue overalls so they'd look like rail workers, cut the phone lines to both the rail center and the local village and waited. When the train stopped at the red signal, the gang swiftly carried out the robbery and scarpered back to the farm where they holed up for a few days. But the men were forced to leave earlier than planned when they heard police were searching all properties in the area. Roy James, also known as the Weasel, delivered some excitement to the residents of Ryder's Terrace when he was discovered hiding in a muse house. He led police on a rooftop chase before being taken into custody. What happened last night? Well, my husband and I were watching television. Suddenly I heard a tremendous knocking of the house opposite. And then they dragged him down, about 10 policemen dragged him down into the mews. And I said to the detective, you know, who have you caught, who have you captured? And he said, it was all right, we've got him. A portion of Roy James' take was discovered in a nearby telephone box. Three of the men who carried out the great train robbery were never identified. 13 members of the gang went to trial in 1964. Realizing that the Crown case against them was extremely strong, and they were looking at a long stretch at Her Majesty's pleasure, their thoughts turned to escape. The group smuggled a blank key into the prison and used it to make a duplicate to the cells. But before the plan could be executed, they were betrayed by accomplice Bill Bowl and forced to go into a complete lockdown throughout the trial. Much of the evidence was tedious, and boredom combined with the hot courtroom led many jurors to nod off. But when driver Jack Mills took the stand, his vivid and detailed testimony made the jurors sit up and take notice. Just two weeks into the trial, a police officer inadvertently let slip that Biggs had prior convictions, thus prejudicing his case and forcing a retrial. But the cases of the other accused continued. On March the 23rd, 1964, the jury found all the men guilty of conspiracy to rob, while Tom Wiseby, Roy James, Charlie Wilson, Bob Welch, Jim Hussey, and Gordon Goody were all found guilty of robbery with violence. A month later, Biggs was also convicted. The robbers were sentenced to a total of 307 years prison between them. At the time of the sentencing, Buster Edwards and Bruce Reynolds remained on the run. But as the armored van took the 13 convicted great train robbers to their new home in Aylesbury Prison, it wasn't quite the end of the story. Within the decade, two of them would be the most wanted men in Britain after daring escapes. And it would be mastermind Bruce Reynolds behind bars. Coming up, the Brighton bombing. In the morning of October the 12th, 1984, Margaret Thatcher came within a hair's breadth of being the second prime minister in British history to be assassinated. A powerful bomb ripped through the Brighton Hotel where the Conservative Party had gathered for its annual conference. Five people were killed, including Conservative MP Sir Anthony Berry and the wife of Cabinet Minister John Wakeham. Several others were seriously injured. The provisional Irish Republican Army swiftly claimed responsibility. It released a statement that read, Mrs. Thatcher will now realize that Britain cannot occupy our country and torture our prisoners and shoot our people in their own streets and get away with it. Today, we were unlucky, but remember, we only have to be lucky once. You will have to be lucky always. Give Ireland peace and there will be no war. Patrick McGee, an Irish-born IRA volunteer, planted the bomb four weeks earlier. He stayed in the Grand Hotel under the name Ray Walsh and hid a 30-pound bomb in the bathroom wall of room 629 that was rigged to explode 24 days later. When it did, the bomb blew a hole in the hotel. Thatcher was still dressed in evening clothes going through official papers. My husband was in bed and all the windows went and the bathroom was extremely badly in damaged. In your own room? Yes, yes, we were, we, were, we were very lucky. 
You hear about these atrocities, these bombs. You don't expect them to happen to you. But life must go on as usual. And your conference Thank will you go on. Much. Thank conference you. will go on. Thank you. Conference, all right, all right, John. The yeah. conference will go on as usual. Thank you very right. much. Thatcher and her husband Dennis were evacuated from the hotel and spent the rest of the night at a local police college, still in the dark about the extent of casualties. But the Prime Minister remained determined to go ahead with the conference. After just an hour's sleep, she spent the morning rewriting much of her speech and used it to send a defiant message to the IRA. She said, the bomb attack was an attempt not only to disrupt and terminate our conference, it was an attempt to cripple Her Majesty's democratically elected government. This is the scale of the outrage in which we've all shared, and the fact that we are gathered here now, shocked but composed and determined, is a sign not only that this attack has failed, but that all attempts to destroy democracy by terrorism will fail. Then she went straight from the conference to visit the injured in hospital, including her minister, John Wakeham, who was so badly wounded, he almost lost his legs. Police followed McGee for several months before arresting him in Scotland and charging him with carrying out the bombing. He was convicted because police alleged his fingerprint was found on a hotel registration card recovered from the bomb site. But while McGee admitted he was a member of the team that carried out the bombing, he has always denied leaving his print on the card. He said the bombing was carried out to avenge the death of Bobby Sands, a member of the IRA and elected member of parliament, who died in prison while on a hunger strike in 1981. The attack shook up the many members of parliament staying at the hotel. But, but the prime minister's bathroom was completely destroyed, and the foreign secretary's uh, sitting room, and mine was the next one along. None of us were hurt there. Mr. Gummo, whereabouts were you when you, the explosion happened? Well, I was with the Prime Minister at the time, and the explosion happened just as we were packing up. What, what were you doing, and, and what did you hear? Well, there was just a, a loud bang. It sounded like two bangs, but I wouldn't like to be uh, too precise about that. And we were merely putting the papers away, having completed the work for, for tomorrow. McGee served 14 years of a life sentence before being released in 1999 under the terms of the Good Friday Agreement, a peace accord between Britain and the IRA that led to the release of several high-profile IRA prisoners. McGee was kept in a secure concrete bunker during his prison term and used the time to study at Open University, leaving jail with a PhD for which he was awarded first-class honors. Although he continues to defend the IRA's bombing campaign, the former terrorist has expressed regret for the casualties. In November 2000, he met Joe Tufnell, the daughter of Sir Anthony Berry, as part of the Forgiveness Project that promoted reconciliation within the peace process. Of getting to know the man who caused her father's death, Tufnell said, it helped her put a human face to the conflict. I feel I've been recovering some of the humanity I lost when that bomb went off, she said. Pat is also on a journey to recover his humanity. I've realized that no matter which side of the conflict you're on, had we all lived each other's lives, we could all have done what the other did. According to actor Kristen Slater, good judgment comes from experience. Sometimes experience comes from bad judgment. And with several arrests chalked up over a number of years, the Hollywood bad boy has experienced quite a few police cells and courtrooms. In 1989, when his career was just hitting its stride, Slater led police on a drunken car chase through West Hollywood. When he crashed his car into a telephone pole, Slater kicked a police officer with his cowboy boots before attempting to escape over a fence. He was later convicted of drink driving. In 1994, Slater was caught attempting to bring a gun onto a plane with him. Then, just three years later, events at a wild party had serious consequences. While high on drugs, Slater punched his then-girlfriend, Michelle Jones, in the face and attacked the arresting officer. Felony charges against him were eventually dropped, and after pleading no contest to the remaining charges, the star was sent to jail for three months, of which he served 59 days due to good behavior. He was also ordered into rehab. 
sadly, that wasn't the end of the story for the troubled actor. In 2004, he was back in court, charged with third-degree sexual abuse after it was alleged that a drunken Slater had grabbed a woman's bottom late at night on a Manhattan street. Police said they'd responded to a call from someone else, not the woman who was allegedly attacked. The misdemeanor of forcible touching carries a sentence of up to a year in jail. But the 37-year-old refused to accept a plea bargain that would have spared him any jail time. A few months later, at pre-trial hearing, prosecutors offered to adjourn the case in contemplation of dismissal. The judge agreed to drop the charges on the condition that the star kept out of trouble for six months. Slater's high profile meant he had to endure a media circus every time he turned up to court. Asked about his state of mind during the trial, the actor said the intense media scrutiny was disconcerting. I would say that there's more chaos right here now, <laughs> and it's hilarious. Christian, is this an annoyance for you? Slater has also experienced chaos in his personal life of the not-so-funny kind. Being on the receiving end of an assault by his then-wife, Ryan Haddon, in 2002. Haddon was arrested but not charged over the incident in the Hard Rock Cafe in Las Vegas, which saw Slater requiring stitches to the face after being hit with a glass. The couple separated a few months later, then finalized their divorce in 2006, citing irreconcilable differences. When it came to the dropping of his own assault charge, Slater's attorney, Eric France, said that they were pleased with the result and that it was an acceptable outcome. The case is dismissed and we're pleased with the outcome and everybody's decision that that was the appropriate resolution. Slater has performed several stage roles and is currently set to star in a television series titled My Own Worst Enemy. Coming up, Al Capone's contribution to organized crime. In the sweltering heat, hundreds of elite university students are undergoing grueling military training. With the world's largest standing army, China is hardly in need of any more new recruits. But this training, which involves old-fashioned bayonet and martial arts skills, is designed to instill character and grit in a generation often seen as pampered and spoilt. Unlike past generations, China's youth today has only known steady economic growth and relative political calm. It was a different story for the generation that came before them. Their demands for democracy and freedom met with brutal repression and the slaughter of hundreds of protesters in China's capital, Beijing, at Tiananmen Square. For seven weeks, demonstrators, mostly university students, occupied the plaza at Beijing's cultural heart. On May the 4th, 1989, 100,000 people marched through Beijing calling for freedom of the press and the opportunity to discuss their concerns with the party hierarchy. The rapid spread of the protest and the wide range of people joining the students alarmed the communist leadership. The government declared martial law and sent in the tanks to crush the demonstration. On June the 4th, a shocked world saw footage of hundreds of young people being gunned down by soldiers in Tiananmen Square. Reporters saw tanks lumbering up the boulevard, firing indiscriminately. Students who fled to nearby buses to take shelter were hunted down and assaulted by soldiers. Rickshaw drivers risked their lives to dart under the line of fire and rescue wounded people. It only took a few hours for authorities to clear the square. When the bloodshed was over, Troops searched university campuses to locate and beat those believed to have played a part in organizing the demonstrations. Protests broke out in solidarity in some of China's other provinces, but they were swiftly suppressed. The bloody episode badly damaged China's reputation and was widely condemned by leaders all over the world. Compulsory military training for university students was launched after the Tiananmen Square protests designed to stamp out the spiritual pollution inspired by demands for more democracy. But while the Chinese government has not made the same heavy-handed mistake since Tiananmen, 
Repression and lack of freedom still remain problems simmering under the surface. China's youth has been presented with a carefully sanitized version of China's recent history. But dissidents still risk death when they rail against the status quo. The beaming baby face of Alfonso Capone belied his profession of standover man, bootlegger, and gangster. Capone's organized crime syndicate was constantly at war with the feds, the Chicago police, and other criminals. Chicago in the 1920s was a place of violence and racketeering. New York-born Capone moved there to join Johnny Torrio's street gang, where he quickly became a valued member. The national law of prohibition, which banned the sale of alcohol, made illegal manufacture and supply of spirits a lucrative underworld industry. Capone became the gang leader in 1925, and his ruthless repression of other criminal groups took him to the top of the heap. The newly formed Federal Bureau of Investigation was desperate to indict him, but despite his connection to a number of murders, the wily criminal evaded their net. The Chicago Crime Commission named him as public enemy number one. But while violence was his trade, like many crime bosses, Capone tried to buy favor with the little people. He set up soup kitchens during the Depression and paid for a daily milk ration to be distributed to school children. He was also renowned for sending thousands of dollars worth of flowers to the funerals of opponents. The violence came to a head in 1929 with the notorious Valentine's Day Massacre, a hit engineered by Capone to take out associates of the Bugs Moran mob. Assassins posing as police gunned down seven men in a garage. And although the crime was never officially solved, it's generally accepted that it was masterminded by Jack Machine Gun McGurn on Capone's orders. But Treasury agents Elliot Ness and Frank Wilson, known as the untouchables for their imperviousness to payoffs, doggedly pursued Capone and other organized crime figures. As well as criminal charges, Ness was determined to have an impact on Capone's bottom line and reputation. By carrying out constant raids and destroying stills and liquor stockpiles, Ness made it harder and harder for Capone's outfit to keep up its promised bootleg supplies. In a blow to Capone's pride, Ness organized a convoy of shiny vehicles to parade past his headquarters, all of them confiscated from the mobster. Capone was outraged, and it was Ness who discovered the crude set of accounts during a warehouse raid that provided the evidence needed to send Capone to trial for tax evasion. Capone pleaded guilty to the offenses, then boasted to the newspapers that he'd struck a deal to serve just two and a half years behind bars. However, he was in for a rude shock. At the sentencing, the judge informed him he wasn't bound by any deal. Capone quickly changed his plea to not guilty, and the matter went before a jury in 1931 that duly found the mobster guilty as charged. Capone was sentenced to 11 years in prison, fined $50,000, and charged $215,000 plus interest on back taxes. It was the beginning of the end for the gangster. Confined in the bleak world of Alcatraz prison, he developed dementia as a result of a syphilis infection and became paranoid and disoriented. On his release in 1939, Capone was transferred to a hospital for brain treatment before returning home. His mental capacity continued to worsen, and he never resumed his criminal activities, dying in 1947 at his estate in Florida. Coffers had swelled to about 2.3 million pounds, or 30 million pounds in today's money. The overnight train left Glasgow on Wednesday night. 
At three the next morning, driver Jack Mills had just passed Leighton Buzzard when he saw a red light signaling him to stop at Sears Crossing. The train came to a halt. What Mills didn't realize was the signal had been rigged by stuffing a glove over the green light and attaching a six volt battery to the red. Co-driver David Whitby got out of the train to see what the problem was. He discovered the railway communications cable had been cut. Before he could get back into the train, he was attacked, handcuffed, and thrown down the embankment. In view of the robbery, British Railway's rulebook was later amended to prohibit drivers from leaving the cab when they encountered a red light. Meanwhile, one of the robbers entered the cabin and knocked Jack Mills unconscious, leaving him bleeding from a big gash on his head. Although no one was seriously hurt, the experience shook the victims badly, especially Jack Mills, who never worked again. Like a very long year to you, Mr. Mills. Yes, sir. How do you feel now, yourself? Oh, How are you feeling? I feel all right in myself. Yes. But, uh, can't get rid of the complications in my right arm. Yes. You're going back, you're, you're back at driving, aren't you, here? Well, it's at preparing, oiling. And, yes. Uh, and how's it going? Oh, not too bad. Uh, you think... Capone's Gangland Wars. But first, the great train robbery. Britain's Royal Mail Train, the Glasgow to London travelling post office. On August the 9th, 1963, it was the scene of a crime that captivated a nation, the Great Train Robbery. The operation to steal millions of pounds in used unmarked bills was planned with precision and carried out with unparalleled daring. The thieves targeted the second carriage from the front, where valuables, mostly cash, were stored. Usually the train only carried about 300,000 pounds, but because it had been a bank holiday weekend in Scotland, This time on Crime Inc. Margaret Thatcher's narrow escape. Actor Kristen Slater in court again. The tragedy of Tiananmen Square. And El Capone. You'll be back driving again soon? No, I, don't, I don't think so. The gang uncoupled the train, the taking just the engine and the carriage containing the loot. All those were too long. But they hit their first oh, snag. It's a long time, isn't it? Although they'd recruited a train driver known only as Peter, he found the train was more complicated than he'd expected. The gang was forced to bring Mills back to consciousness and get the groggy driver to move the train forward half a mile to Bridego Bridge. The robbery was carried out with such efficiency that none of the 75 male sorters left behind in the uncoupled carriages realized what had happened. The four sorters in the valuables compartment were tied up while 120 mail and money bags weighing two and a half tons were loaded into a lorry.